I'm going to jump to Acts 17, verse 16 today, if you guys want to jump there. <clears throat> so Acts 17, 16 is where we're going to jump. So we're basically just going to get right in this today because I've got a very long sermon. Um, ask Ryan. <clears throat> His fingers still hurt, right? How are they doing back there? They're shaky. Will you be able to reopen the barbershop on Tuesday, you think? Okay, good, good, okay. So Acts 17, verse 16. Um, in this passage, we, we basically see Paul is in Athens. And he's there, and he's kind of wandered around the city, and he's seeing some of their gods that they worship, some of their idols that they have. And as he's seeing them, he's... It, we, well, let's just jump right into 16 here. So now while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him. As he saw that the city was full of idols... So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him. And some said, what does this babbler wish to say? Others said, he seems to be a preacher of foreign de deities. Because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection, and they took him and brought him to Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting. For you bring some strange things to our ears. We wish to know, therefore, what these things mean. Now all the Athenians and foreigners who lived there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. So Paul, standing in the midst of Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription, To the own unknown God. What therefore you worship is unknown, this I proclaim to you. Father God, we... We lift up to you your name. We lift up to you your presence this morning as, as we receive this word. Lord, I ask that you would, you would continually strip me away from, from me. Let this be your word coming forth. Let this be your teaching this morning. Let this be your encouragement. Let this be your life-changing moment this morning. Lord, I ask once again that you would just dwell within us. You would open our hearts, open our minds to you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Now, now, Paul has, at the beginning of that passage, it says Paul had his spirit provoked within him. How many of us have had our spirit provoked within us? At least once in our life. We've all had our spirit provoked within us. That's why we're here this morning. God spoke to us. The Holy Spirit spoke to us and encouraged us to be here even this morning. Now, in the city of Athens, where he is, where Paul is, we, we see the number of gods that they have. See, this, this group of people, they were very so much polytheistic. They had so many gods that they worshipped. It was such a huge number that they actually had one extra god called the unknown god. Now, when you think about this, you had to put this in context. The reason they had one unknown god was because they wanted to make sure they covered everything. They didn't miss anything. And just in case... They had that one unknown God, the just-in-case God that they worshipped. Now, this morning, I'm going to be honest with you, I have no intention of breaking this passage down at all. I'm just using this as a segue to get to where I really want to be this morning. Is that okay? Okay, good, because you can't stop me now. I'm already talking. Sound guy can stop me, but he knows better. <clears throat> so Paul here is actually going to use the culture of the Athens to talk to them about Christ. He's going to use their culture to explain Jesus to them. That's kind of an important task that we all have before us as well. As Christians, I, I'm guilty of this as well, but sometimes we look at our culture around us and don't we say, hey, you know what, it's, it's way too evil. How, how can God use this? How can God use this situation to glorify his son when it's this evil and this dark? And sometimes, you know, we run away from stuff instead of saying, you know what, there's, there's a way we can use this to reach people for Christ. There's a way we can do this. T today I want to give an example of how we can move into not being abused by the culture, but instead use the culture. 
I, I think that's something very important that we, that we need to know how to do as a church. It's, it's part of being an apologist. It's part of being an evangelist. Is, is somebody who can use things around and explain them in a way somebody can understand through their interest or whatever into who Christ is. <clears throat> I do want to add one area of caution to this, though. Okay, if you're looking at culture, because we have a very strong drinking culture, do we not? Okay, as an example, would, would it be appropriate if you're an alcoholic for you to decide, you know what, I want to start a bar ministry. And I want to go bar hopping on weekends and, and make that my ministry. It's probably not a good idea. Okay, so if, you're, if you've been past life involved with something and you've closed a door to a certain sin in your life, should you have that temptation of reopening it later? No, don't, don't do that. So today, I want to talk about, and I'm, I'm going to basically go through a teaching today of, I will not be used, I will not be abused by the culture. Instead, I will use the culture. Actually, let's, let's start off this morning by saying that this morning. I will not be abused by the culture. I will use the culture. <clears throat> now, today's sermon is actually one that I wrote back in 2011. A long time ago. Um, a decade ago. Now, you're wondering why youth leader Nate is up here this morning. I asked him to. He was actually here, or there, one of the first times I did this sermon. He was one of the youths at the church down the road where I did this for the very first time. I did it here. I did it at home with my kids, too. But I've done this several times over the years. And <clears throat> when I knew I was going to be your senior pastor, I prayed and I said, God, you know, there's one sermon one sermon of my entire life that I did that I want to be able to do again. One. Just one. This is it. This is the one. And today just happens to be the perfect day to do it because of what today is. I know you're all like sitting on the edge of your seat. I can see the anticipation, the excitement. What's he going to say? <clears throat> Today's sermon is entitled, The Pumpkin of His Eye. This is an example that you can use as a way to reach people for the lost. Um, it's being recorded, obviously, so send them the link. Um, it's it's non-threatening, but you know what? It's, it's a good way for us to start to look at evangelism, start to look at apologetics a little bit. What are some of the ways we can reach the culture around us? The trunk or treat last night was, was just kind of a start on that. So let's, let's go ahead and get my prop and get things ready to go this morning. You don't have to follow me with the camera. Um, you might want to mute me when I go past the speaker. Because, <clears throat> you know, you need one of these, too, if you're going to do this kind of stuff, right? Does a rabbit pop out? No, I'm not a magician. Um, no, no hats or anything. Jamie and I put this together yesterday. Now, what's, what's the first thing that God does? Now, now the first thing God does when he's, when he's looking for an individual who he knows is going to follow Christ, the, the first thing he does is he's, he, we know he's, he's knocking at every door. But we, we know only certain doors are going to respond. So, I mean, he's walking around. He's looking for the perfect one. And I'm taking this one. Mostly because this one's mine. <clears throat> he picks the pumpkin. Is, is this pumpkin popular? Is this pumpkin special in any way other than Christ picked it? I mean, it, there's, there's nothing to this pumpkin other than it's, it's a pumpkin. I mean, it, actually, it's kind of, it looked much better the other way, didn't it? But look how scarred and broken up that is on that side. I mean, is, isn't this what God wants to do? And, and, you know, this is one of the things, too, that if we're the body of Christ, we, we see the scars that people have. We see the damage they have. But don't we also spend our time helping them, you know, not really being drawn to their scars, but instead seeing what God's doing through their scars, how God is affecting their life, how God's moving them forward. Luke 5.31 through 32. Luke 5.31 through 32 reads, And Jesus answered them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have not called... I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Jesus came and died for one purpose, for the sinner. 
He came for those that need a healing, those that need him and would receive him. Now, as we look at this pumpkin today, we, we've seen the imperfections. We've even seen some dirt on it as well, right? I know I got all kinds of tricks up here this morning. No rabbits, sorry. As we look at this pumpkin, we see those imperfections. We see that flat side. Matthew 8, 1 through 3. Matthew 8, 1 through 3. When he came down from the mountain, great clouds followed him, and behold, a leper came to him and knelt before him, saying, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. And Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him, saying, I will be clean. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. See, some of our problems in our life today has to do with sin that we've, we've committed. Now, here's, here's the question, though. That leper, what was one of the first things the leper did? Didn't the leper say, clean me? Please cleanse me. Maybe some, some of the reason that we have sin in our life is because we haven't asked God to actually cleanse us. When we've got that one sin that's nagging us, that one sin that's keeping us from being fully engaged into Him, have we asked Him to clean us of that? Have we gone to Him and said, Lord, I, I need You to cleanse me of that sin? Remember those hair loss commercials? Remember at the, at the end, the guy always said, you know, I'm not just the president, I'm also a client. Let me throw this out for you, okay? Because some people think I'm perfect. None of them here, obviously, but because you all know me well enough to know I'm not. But I, not only am I your pastor, I'm also a sinner, okay? <clears throat> I need the same washing just as much as you guys do, just as much as those watching online, just as much as those watching later are going to need that same cleaning, that same cleansing, so how does it begin, though? Well, it begins with, God, can, can you cleanse me? Can you wash me? Let me put this back this way. So what's Jesus' response? Well, the response of Jesus is, yeah, I can wash you. I can clean you. Oh, man, now I'm making a mess. Cleaning Lee is going to kill me. <clears throat> Sorry, hon. So Jesus starts to clean. He starts to wash. He starts to put it all back together. See, this right here, as soon as you ask Jesus to cleanse you, though, what is this process? This is the beginning of your salvation. This is the beginning of your walk with the Lord. This is you saying to God, I want to be cleansed. I want to be used by you. I want to be yours. And that's where it all begins, right there. It's the moment when you say, God, I need you to be in control. God, I need you to take the wheel. God, it's all about you. And this is the moment that, moment that he's going to clean you, and he's going to start to put your life back together where it belongs. James 4, 8. James 4, 8 reads, Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. So this brings us to the next step in the process. It's kind of a puny knife. Which is where God's going to start to open you up. This is the part where he's going to really start to do the work in your life. This is the part where he's going to try to get inside. My mom always taught me to cut one side across flat so it kind of, you have the one spot where you can get back in there. You know where the, which way the lid goes. And I'm probably not cutting this big enough, so let's go bigger. Watch my finger. I should pull out the bigger knife. That's right. <laughs> yeah, the, my biggest fear of doing this, though, is cutting you, my hand. But unfortunately, I'm using them both this morning. Thanks for your vote of confidence, Al. <laughs> All right, so after he gets you cut open and he gets into you, yeah, oh boy, look at that. See, he's going to start to work on your double-mindedness. 
He's going to start to work on the things in your life that is taking your joy away. He's going to start to work on the things in your life that is a distraction. He's going to start to work on the things in your life that, that doesn't need to be there. He's going to start to pull things out that you don't need. He's going to start to do something that's terrible in the human fleshly mindset because it's a destruction of the flesh. But you know it has to be done. 2 Corinthians 6, 16 through 7, 1. Go ahead, Nate. Hello. Good morning. Verse 16. What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God said, I will make my dwelling among them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore, go out from their midst... And be separate from them, says the Lord, and touch no unclean thing. Then I will welcome you, and I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. Since we have these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit, bringing holiness to completion in the fear of God. See, now that, now that God's in the house, he has access into the house. He's not going to leave it the same. Take a look at that. How great and wonderful is that? Look at all that slime and seeds and junk in there that shouldn't be there. It's all the sin we have. Does God want us to have sin in our lives? No. He wants it removed. He wants it taken out. Um, Psalm 51.2 reads, Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Uh, 51.10 book of Psalms as well, reads, create, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. See, the cleaning in our lives, puny little spoon, the cleaning in our lives takes some work. It takes an effort. I keep pulling cool stuff out. <laughs> I found some new tools, so... This process would take a little bit less time, I hope. See, as, as the pumpkin, as I'm working here at this, this stuff's not coming out easy. So there's some stuff that we, we hang on to a little bit too much, am I right? I mean, think, think about some of the sins we have in our lives that, that we hang on to. We don't want to get rid of them. But ultimately, in order to clean our life up, we've got to have that stuff pulled out. We've got to have it removed. It takes a process. It's not something that's going to happen quite easily overnight all of the time. It's something that's going to take an effort. It's going to take some energy. It's going to take some patience on your part. But it's going to happen. As we go through these changes in our life, will there be changes that other people are going to see? I mean, this pumpkin is going to be emptied out in just a little bit. See, will some of these changes be hard to go through? I mean, this pumpkin right now is probably screaming at me, don't do this, this hurts, this is too painful. Don't we have that sometimes with the Lord? Don't we have sometimes where he's making a change in us and we say, there is a pain associated with this. There's a hurt. See, another line in one of my, favorites, one of my other favorite songs, because I've got like seven million, God needs to change her heart before he changes her shirt. Let that sink in for a second. God needs to change her heart before he changes her shirt. The change has to happen on the inside first before the change is going to happen on the outside. It's a good spot for an amen. Thanks, Linda. See, our, our society around us says, you know what? You, you just need to be you. You just need to make a small little change, and your life's going to be fine. You, you just say, oh, you know what, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, and life will be fine. That's what society's telling us, but in reality, are those changes that society's making, are they actually getting the pumpkin cleaned? No. They're not. They're not changing anything. It's, instead, you're still going to fall short. See, everything is, is still in your strength. So I have to slow down the carving of the inside or else 
I won't have enough left at the end here. Because you see, over time, God's not just going to clean you out completely all at once. He's going to take his time doing it. Because, you know, you have a lifetime to go through this process. A lifetime. Nate, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 19. Nevertheless, God's solid foundation stands firm, sealed with this inscription, The Lord knows those who are his, and everyone who confesses the name of the Lord must turn away from wickedness. See, if we're still living in our sinful ways, I'd like to say it might be time to look at our life in God and kind of try to figure out what we have as a, as a true true calling, a true purpose, a true reason what we're really doing here. See, if we're still living in our sinful ways, we're not being cleaned. We're not allowing God to do his work within us. See, our, our whole Christian walk, we should be spending our time getting our pumpkin cleaned. Okay? It's, it's what we should be doing from the moment we get washed all the way through. It's a lifetime process. Um, how about verses 20 and 21? In a large house, there are articles not only of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay. Some are for special purposes and some for common use. Those who cleanse themselves from the latter will be instruments for special purposes, made holy, useful to the master, and prepared to do any good work show you what we've got so far see the the inside of our pumpkin should be getting pretty clean but still a mess in there right still some work to do i mean if this was your kid's pumpkin what, what would you do get, get back in the other room and finish that right it's kind of like the laundry or dishes you didn't do a good enough job get back in there finish it up see it's it's christ's job to get the sin out but it's also your job to get the sin out as well don't put yourself into positions of temptation. Keep yourself from that. That's what God's ultimate plan is. Uh, Philippians three twelve through 15. Not that I have already obtained this, or I am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do. Forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way. And if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. See, in other words, if you think you're perfect, guess what? You're not. And you know what the best part of that is? God's, God's going to reveal it to you. God's going to reveal your imperfection. He's going to show that to you. He's going to show you that you're not perfect. And it's not a case that he's being wrathful. It's not a case that he's being evil. He's trying to bring you to a maturity. He's trying to bring you to a new position, a new place within him. I know who's going to clean this up later, Jamie. So, <clears throat> one of my jobs at work is I do uh, I do some computer programming. It's it's a lot of fun. But anybody who's ever written a computer program, do they always work 100% accurately all the time, every single time? No, no, no. There's always mistakes. There's always problems that take place, and I always build into my codes this this little ID10 error code that pops up. Uh, for those of you who aren't laughing right now, uh, Ryan, can you throw up my ID10T code? Um, if you read that out, you'll understand why everyone else is laughing. I'm uh, basically calling myself an idiot because usually it's a stupid mistake. It's not something that, it's not something that is a huge blatant mistake, but it's like, oh, that was simple. That was so dumb. And it's so sad when I see, see one like that. Now, God's not going to throw up a great big, huge ID10T code before you. He's not like that. See, God, when you make a mistake, when you screw up in life, 
He's going to ask you to just come back to him. Seek him out. He's not going to blast you. He's not going to treat you like crud because you made a mistake and you had one little sin that, that came in. See, we all make mistakes. God still has one major, well, a bunch of gifts for us. Mercy, grace, forgiveness that he'll offer to each one of us. And all we have to do is ask. Pretty simple. Pretty simple. Get this out of here. Matthew 14, we see one of those moments. The disciples have climbed into the boat and they've left Jesus behind on the shore. As the boat had traveled along from the land, they, they see Jesus on the water. Yes, he's walking on the water towards them and they thought he was a ghost, but he speaks to them before they freak out completely and they, he tells them, it, it's, it's me, it's Jesus, it's okay, everything's fine. So Matthew 14, 28. Nate, go ahead. And Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying to him, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. The, the next thing we've got to do here on our pumpkin is we have to prepare the eyes. What are we looking at? Now, just as, as that passage of Scripture John's being, or John, sorry, Peter is being called out of the boat. And when he gets called out of the boat, he's, he's basically told, keep your eyes on me. Keep your eyes on me. When you, when you lose your faith, when your faith is absent, who are you putting your eyes on? Not on Jesus. You're putting your eyes on something else. Now, I'm going to use triangle for the eyes. I hope that's okay with everybody. It's my pumpkin. Um, <clears throat> the reason I'm using triangles is, is very simply this. Um, the triangle is kind of like uh, a trinity, isn't it? It's three-sided. Maybe I want the smaller knife for this part. It's, it's the trinity. It shows three sides. Now, the word trinity does not appear in Scripture, but the word trinity is, is a word that represents the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And when we, when we worship God and we have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit that, that we're actually ch chasing after, our life has a whole new focus. Our life now has a, a purpose and a merit in it that we're seeking after. See, the three parts that we're seeking after is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He's three parts just like we are three parts. So we seek out after him. Nate, if you could read the next two, Psalm 119 and Hebrews 12. Psalm 119, verse 37. Turn my eyes from looking at worthless things and give me life in your ways. Hebrews 12, 2. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. Now he is seated in the place of honor beside God's throne. Perfect. Thanks, Nate. See, there's no better way to fix our gaze than on the Lord and not on ourselves, not on our problems. Now, obviously, if I was at home and I had more time, I would cut these more appropriately, but, you know, the angled out and everything else, so the spacing is bigger. Yeah, you know what? You all don't have anything to do today. There's no football on today. Jesus is way more important what he's done in your life. I'm guessing. I'm hoping, anyway. So the, the next step, the next step in the carving process here is part of the face should I do next. I'm going to tell you what, side, what piece we're going to do next. Let me get my marker out and I'll draw it. See, the, the next thing we need to worry about is our mouth, because 
How many of you guys have a mouth this morning? If you don't have a mouth, I'm sorry. But we should probably put a big old smiley face on there, right? Big old smiley face. Because, because ultimately, what does Jesus do to your face and to your countenance when you come to him? He lifts. He uplifts. He brings life to you. So I, I've got a bunch of verses for you to read here, Nate. I think there's six of them in total. Why don't you read those while I take the time of butchering this face? <laughs> First verse is out of Romans chapter 10, verses 8 through 10. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because... If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. The second scriptures in Matthew chapter 12, verse 36 through 37 says, I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give account for every careless word they speak. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. Proverbs chapter 10 verse 19 says this, When words are many, transgression is not lacking, but whoever restrains his lips is prudent. Still in Proverbs chapter 13 verse 2, From the fruit of their lips people enjoy good things but the unfaithful have an appetite for violence. Chapter 13, verse 3, Those who guard their lips preserve their lives, but those who speak rashly will come to ruin. In Proverbs chapter 21, verse 23, Whoever keeps his mouth and his tongue keeps himself out of trouble. See, the mouth is very important because what comes out of your mouth has an impact. The words that you speak can't be unspoken. As soon as you speak that word, whether it's in anger or haste, the other person's already heard it. It's been received. It's being processed. You, you may have injured. You may have built somebody else up. That's why our mouth is so important that we keep our tongue bridled. We keep our, our mouth bridled as well. We, we make sure we're using wise and good words as we speak them out. Now, the last piece of the face is the nose, which is, which is kind of an important part. It's a very important piece of the face because we all have noses looking around, beautiful noses, some big, some small, some holding glasses, some not. So, Nate, if you could read the next couple of verses, I'm going to put a nose on this guy. Matthew chapter 10, verse 37 through 39. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Luke chapter 14 verse 27 says this, Whoever does not carry his own cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. I was supposed to carve faster. <laughs> Evidently, I'm, I'm losing it in my old age. That's the important thing. I'm taking my time. Because I think this is an important message this morning for somebody whether it's somebody here or somebody out in Facebook land, I think this is an important message. Now, how's that for a cross? I do okay? And, and notice, as I'm working on this, I'm still pulling crud outside of the pumpkin. As God is, is changing your life, he's, he's, he's going to continue to change your countenance on the outside, but he's, he's also going to continue to work on the inside. Okay, so as I'm working, I'm still pulling stuff out. I hate saying that, you know, it's like during this whole process, I'm God, but I hate that because I don't want to ever put myself in that position. But ultimately, isn't this what God's doing to you? He's, he's making this change. He is, he's doing this for you. 
because he wants you to be just like his son. <clears throat> I don't even want to symbolize it. I don't even think I'm worthy of that. So, <clears throat> see, now, now the cross. The cross. Now, the, Jesus says, take up your cross and follow me. It's, it's an important piece of this whole thing. Take up your cross and follow me. You ever watch a, a dog, and you've got a dog who is, is chasing after something, let's say a criminal, bad guy, like, here, smell this rag, come on, smell this, smell this, okay, go, find him. What's that, what's that dog following the entire time? The scent, but isn't he following his nose? His nose is leading the way. Just like us, when, when we're looking at something, our nose is pointing right at it. Our nose is like an arrow that's pointing out before us. So this cross is the thing that's forefront before us. It's the thing that we're supposed to be following after. It's the cross of Christ. As we're chasing after him, we should be scenting him. We should be smelling him as we're chasing after him and as we're following him completely. See, now, also notice in my pumpkin here, how perfect is it? Lies. Brown noser. <laughs> Brown noser. No offense, my. It, I've only got a couple more. It's not a big deal. I only got a few. You don't have anything. I know you're unarmed. It's all right. See, everything's not perfect. Because you know what? In life, are, are you going to turn up perfect before you die? No, not even close. But you, you know what? It, it's it's okay. It's okay. The important thing is, are, are you seeking after God? Do you have, do you have, are you fixated on that cross? Are you chasing after that first and foremost in your life, chasing after Christ? Are you allowing him to work on the inside? Are you allowing him to change you? Those are the important things. See, there's, there's paths that, that are going to affect us as well. There's sin in our life that, that even as God's working on us, there's sin, there's choices we're going to make, they're going to have an impact here on the outside as well. I mean, I hate to use the example, but how many of you guys have ever looked at the newspaper before and after pictures of somebody who got arrested for meth? You know, especially if they've had like five or six arrests and they put all the pictures up. Is, isn't that sin something that's, that's destroying their outside? Yeah, definitely. And it's sad. It's sad when you see that negative change. 2 Timothy 2, 20 through 21. Now in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honorable use, some for dishonorable. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he will be a vessel for honorable use, set apart as holy, useful to the master of the house, ready for every good work. Placements, everything. See, the, the vessel, because this, this pumpkin now has become a vessel, am I, am I right? It, it, after it gets hollowed out and emptied out, can it now hold something? It's got to be filled with something. And, Ryan, if you could throw up my two vessels that I gave you. Perfect. I mean, the big question is, which, which vessel do you want to be? Do you want to be plasticware that we, we all know plasticware is great. It is awesome stuff. It's for the everyday mundane use and it doesn't really have much value. Because if it had great value, what would you do with the lid to that plastic container? How, how many of you have lost a lid to your favorite plastic container? Yeah, and then what ends up happening, you throw out the dish and then two weeks later, that lid shows up, and you're like, oh, man, I wonder if I could go back to the landfill and get that. Yeah, plastic bags, too, yeah. It's, it's sad, but you know what? The, the other item up there that was up there, you, does anybody recognize that? Does anybody know what that is? The Ming vase. That's a Ming vase. How expensive are they, Heidi? Oh. I imagine you have two or three, right? <laughs> you have two or three, right? <laughs> yes. <clears throat> Yeah, mine too, <laughs> and you were going to gift me one. Um, <laughs> they're priceless. If you own a Ming vase, what are you going to? Are you going to lose the lid to that vase if it has a lid? 
Oh, no. Are you going to pull that out and use it for your leftover macaroni and cheese and stuff it in the fridge? No. What are you going to do with a Ming vase? I'm going to put it in a safe and have it locked up. Well, actually, no, we're talking about me. I'm going to sell it and then spend the money on something else. So that's, that's my plan. That's what I'm going to do with it. See, it's, it's, it's very important when, when we think of what, what kind of pumpkin are we? What kind of pumpkin are you this morning? Are, are you a Tupperware or are you a Ming Voss? Which, which, is, which value do you think God has upon you? See, the, 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 I'm, I'm going to tell you right now, that price of watching his son go to the cross, that price was not just a, well, it's a 50 cent purchase, it's no big deal if we lose the lid. No, no, this was, this was expensive. This was priceless. That's the value that he's put on each one of you this morning is you are priceless. You're priceless in his sight. May I, may I have the lights turned off? For a second. Um, Nate, can you? You probably don't have your Bible, do you? Okay. Well, I'm going to have to read it anyway because the lights are out. Hold on. Let me find it. There it is. John 1 1 through 9. I'm going to try to do this one handed here. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him, was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light, the true light which gives light to everyone. He was coming into the world. Now let me ask you this morning, church, who here, who here is a representative that shows light to other people? Who? Who? Come on. We all are, right? This is the problem with brand new candles. That's okay. Glow sticks would have been fun too, but I had candles and I had a lighter. I did not have glow sticks, so boom. There you go. Salvation. Man, it's nice dark in here. That's giving off a lot of light. <laughs> salvation means, salvation means we have a light within us. We have a light within us. We have... Jesus shining out of us. Now this, I'm so thankful today was a cloudy, dark, gloomy day. Because otherwise, if it was a bright, sunny day in July, this, this one is showing out as, as brightly. But because it's so dark in here today, that stands out. That stands out big time. That's not just a little, a little bit of light that's given off. I mean, I can see the orange glow out front. How's it look on your guys' side? Look good? Not bad for 20 minutes. Now I've got my jack-o'-lantern all done, all ready to go. <clears throat> now this, this light, this light, because if you're a true follower of Christ, you've, this is you. You've got the joy of the Lord. You've got the cross you're fixated on. You've got your eyes fixated on God, the Holy Spirit, the Son. You, you now have a light that you can use to light your path. You now have a way to get you from A to B. And, and this is your salvation. Matthew 5, 14 through 16. Matthew 5, 14 through 16. You are the light of the world. The city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand. And it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. You could turn the... Actually, let's leave the lights off. It's nice. You guys forgot to take your masks off after last night, so I'm still scared. <laughs> See, with, with God working in your life, you can't help but have this light shining forward. You can't help but be this, a beacon, a light to other people, a way of showing them the way to, to get to God, 
the way to get to Jesus, the way to get to eternity. See, when you're, when you're saved, you're going to change. But it's a change from darkness to light. It's, it's a light of Jesus. And you're going to have to show it to others. You're going to want to show others. Because you know what? There's, there's so much warmth and comfort here in Jesus. There's so much warmth and comfort. You, you don't want anybody else to miss out on that. Now let's talk about hell for a moment. Hell is the ultimate place of darkness, is it not? Is there warmth and comfort in hell? Well, there's a lot of warmth, but <laughs> it's, it's a wee bit too much. You know, one of, the, one of the other sick things that I hear from people is, you know, I want to go to heaven, but I don't want anything to do with God. I want to go to heaven, but I want nothing to do with God. You're not going to like heaven at all because, I'm sorry, God is there. The other place, hell, is the place to go if you want to be absent from God. But comes with that, there's a punishment that comes with it as well. Now, as we live our lives, Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 2 reads, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. See, our lives today is not a marathon. Or, excuse me, let me rephrase that. It is a marathon. It's not a sprint. All right, if, if you think you're a Christian walk, if you think you're going to come to perfection overnight, you're going to burn out. It's not going to happen. You're going to be destroyed in the process. It's not going to happen. It's, it's a marathon. I mean, I could pull that cap back off any second, reach in and keep pulling stuff out, but now that there's fire in there, I'm not doing it. The hand of God can do that, but not me. See, there's, there's something that comes to running the race. It's meant to be a slow process. Let's close here today. I think, this is, I think you guys get the uh, illustration purpose here. So let's go ahead and let's close. Somebody wants to, now let's leave the lights off. It's way more entertaining with, in the dark. See, the, the, what I wanted to show you guys today primarily is, isn't there a way that we can have culture around us that's dark, destructive, causing all kinds of turmoil? But, but isn't there ways that we can take culture and turn it around and use it as a way to reach people for Christ, show people what God has done in my life, and, and more importantly, what he wants to do in, in their life? Because, you know, with this pumpkin, I'm sorry, it's extremely happy. It's still a little chilly, but it's extremely happy. Let's, let's pray this morning. Let's pray this morning. See, this is an opportunity today to to invite somebody new to Christ, to, to invite somebody to, to Jesus. See, I know everyone in this room this morning is, is already saved, but you know what, there's, there's still people out there this morning that are in Facebook land or YouTube that are watching this. You know, they, they need to be reminded that they have a God who cares for them. This much, that, that this, is, this is the process of, of what we call sanctification. It's the process of, of changing a life and cleaning a life up for him, that, that they can be used by him. See, this, this is how much, how much God loves you, that he sends his son to die for you in your place. And then he's, he's even the one who's willing to clean up your life. He's the one who's willing to take your sin. He's the one who's willing to forgive you of your sin. See, if you're listening this morning online or throughout the week, I just want to say none of us has a guarantee about tomorrow. Even the next 10 minutes. You can hit pause on the video and, and it'd be over right now. You could be leaving church this morning in your car and God says your, your time's up. That's it. See, if you're, if, you're, if you're a new follower, you say, you know, I want that cleansing today. I want, I want you to clean me this morning. I want you to clean me, God. If you're, if you're saying that this morning, I want you to clean me, God. This is the beginning 
of this process that we talked about this morning and what God wants to do in your life. Now this morning, if you've, if you've already accepted Jesus into your life and, and you're saying, you know what, I, I, I feel like I'm missing out on some of that garbage in my life. I, I don't have the faith I need to have. I don't have the peace I want to have in my life. I don't have the joy that I want to have. My, I don't have the, the ability to have my eyes fixated on you, Lord, because I'm concentrating on the other things around me. I forgot to pick up my cross. I, I haven't done that daily. I haven't done that in a while. It's okay. Today's, today's another day. Today's an opportunity that, that God says, I will meet you. It's real simple. All you have to do is, in either situation, say, Lord, I, I, I want to be that pumpkin of your eye. I want to be that pumpkin of your eye. So let's, let's pray this morning, a sinner's prayer this morning. God, yeah, you can repeat after me. I'm a sinner. I have not lived my life the way you would want me to live. Thank you that you sent Jesus to die on a cross for me. Please forgive my sins. I want you to take control of my life. Guide me in the ways that I should go with you in my heart. Amen. Amen. Father God, I thank you for this morning. I thank you for today. I thank you for this message and for allowing me to bring it this morning. I thank you personally that it is a, it's a constant reminder to me of who you are, a reminder of what you have done in me. Lord, I'm so thankful that you found me in that pumpkin patch. Lord, you, you started a work in me years ago. And Lord, that journey that I'm on now with you of a lifetime will bring me closer to you and closer to your son. I thank you this morning, Jesus, and I love you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. You can hit the lights. Um, anybody who wants prayer this morning, come on up. I'll pray for you. Nate will pray for you. Um, Dave will pray for you. Um, obviously, this message will be shared out on Facebook and YouTube, so definitely look for it. If you've got somebody in your life that you think would benefit from this, send this to it. Send it to them. Share it with them. Or even better yet, stop by. Grab a pumpkin somewhere. Not here. These are my kids. But <clears throat> grab a pumpkin somewhere. Sit down with somebody and go through this with them. You don't have to get as detailed as I did. But you know what? This is a great representation of what God wants to do in your life, how God is working in your life, and what you want to see happen in someone else's life as well. So you guys are dismissed. Thank you very much.